Hey there, welcome to the show. Well, you know, I got to tell you, I'm really excited about this show this week. I know I say that every single week, but I'm really excited this week because I have a special guest joining me in studio and uh, I haven't seen him in a while. We've been uh, meeting over Zoom and things like that. So uh, I do have Tim Hudak, who's going to be joining me in a minute here in the studio. Tim is the CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association and for you political buffs, you'll remember that Tim was the leader of the provincial uh, conservative party. So uh, Tim's going to weigh in on all sorts of stuff. I'll see if I can get him to put on his political hat. We'll see. Um, but yeah, really excited to have him join me. But before I go down that road, you know, uh, just a quick update on what is going on in the world of real estate. And hey, by the way, if you're not following me on Instagram, make sure you do it. The Simple Investor One. You know, we still have uh, open candidates uh, to be able to join us here, professional realtors. Remember, if you follow me, DM me, and maybe I can feature you here on the show. And uh, some great stuff happening at the Simple Investor. We've got a new referral program out, um, final release, all sorts of great things, positive cash flow. Go to the simpleinvestor.com, find out what's actually happening. It's always moving, it's always changing, as does the world of real estate. You know, it's interesting, the numbers, interest rates, all sorts of things changing in this world. Bank of Canada, you know, everybody threatening more interest rate increases. But meanwhile, when we turn around and we watch the inflation index go down, what are they going to do? Well, I guess we're going to find out real soon if they're going to put some more upward pressure. Some people are saying they will, maybe they won't. But I'll tell you, if they do this time, they're going to have to put the brakes on real hard because uh, enough damage done. I think everybody's getting a little sick and tired of you know the bank of canada putting more and more pressure on your pocketbook and i'm one of them for sure um and then on top of that like i said here we are summer market is it going to be a hot market well the temperature may be hot but i think we're gonna be a little lukewarm for the next month or two in real estate i think everybody's kind of playing the wait and see and uh not a lot of inventory so you know what it's gonna make it a little bit more difficult for people to be able to purchase but as I mentioned, joining me now in the studio, I have Tim Hudak. And Tim, welcome to the show. Well, Todd, thanks for being back on the show. It's great to be here, but <laughs> physically at the, the the new headquarters here for, well, you call it the Simple Company because yeah. of all the businesses here. But of course, Simple Investor is simply real estate um, and, and many others. It is gorgeous. I mean, congratulations. You told me that you basically built this place yourself 80 hour work week you got the construction belt back on yeah holy smokes do you do side projects i could use a lot of help <laughs> no i appreciate that tim but yeah you know I, I that was one of the things for for me it's always kind of been a love um you know i like being a carpenter hands-on you know i've got some great staff that uh, were working with me here but yeah it was this vision and you know you and i both know if you have a vision it's normally the person that has a vision that has to complete it and here we are um, and as usual, I always invite all, any of our listeners, if you happen to be out this way in Burlington, join me here. Now that I've had Tim Hudak sitting at the studio, you definitely want to come and see where Tim <laughs> oh, yeah. interviewed, you know, it's really important. So, uh, so, Hey, listen, you know, lot, lots going on in the world. Um, not just real estate, you and I have a whole lot to get caught up on, but of course, you know, one of the main things that we do talk about here, uh, is real estate. I talk a lot about professional realtors. In fact, I've been having some great guests uh, join us who've been following the show for a while. Uh, come on, they tell us a little bit about their business. Tell the tell us how active they are. You know, um, obviously, Tim, you have been at the helm of Arena now for several years as the CEO, and uh, you know, tell us some. I mean, I know a lot of your stuff has come to fruition that you were hoping that would. I know that you constantly are a good advocate for not just realtors, but for home ownership, for tenancies, for development. I mean, you know, tell us what's going on. Well, well, thanks, Todd. It's very kind of you to say it. Yeah, just passed a six-year point, and it's been thrilling. I mean, big focus, obviously, on getting more homes built that people can afford quality rentals as well. We got new legislation that raises the bar to make us North American leaders when it comes to professional standards and continue to advocate for a healthy, thriving real estate market. Part of that, believe it or not, governments can do stupid things. I may have done my share of stupid things in government, so part of that job is to make sure government doesn't do stupid things, that we actually build more homeowners than province, more rentals. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Tim, because uh, since you've been last here, we've had uh, multiple different levels of elections. First federal, you know, provincial, now, you know, uh, the mayoral uh, election in Toronto. One of the things I've got to ask you, though, and you and I have talked about this over the years, is let's talk about supply and demand. 
you know, we talk about uh, I'm a politician. It seems like they, they, they have platforms, but always every single platform contains something that says they're going to build X number of houses. You and I know that from a, from a governmental standpoint, it's just not going to happen. Well, there's that old expression about um, Benjamin Disraeli, the former British prime minister, lies, damn lies to statistics. I guess you could throw in political promises when it comes to numbers as, as, uh, as part of that characterization. But I, I do feel, though, I get what you're saying. I do feel a lot more optimistic than when I had started this job six years ago. Well, in fact, as you know, Todd, you've talked about this program. Some of the ideas that ARIA brought forward to get more supply built that people can actually afford were taken up by the government. They've passed, I think, five different pieces of legislation. And it is showing results. In 2021, we had the most homes built in 30 years. Not as far as we need to go, but we're turning it in the right direction. We had the most purpose-built rentals we've had in three decades as well. And 2022, last year, was our second best year, right? So, you know, my message, and we'll talk about the province and the federal government and the municipalities and such, but my message to decision makers, just keep going down this path. And you put, put your foot on the pedal a bit heavier, but focus on supply, ignore the shiny baubles. Everything really around real estate and affordability is we've not built enough homes, so keep going down this path full speed ahead. Yeah, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. You know, when, when we have increasing immigration, number of people coming into Canada, the necessity of more homes is actually extrapolating. And, and we need to focus on these kind of things. Tim, one of the things I know for sure at, at ARIA, um, at you as the CEO, you've had some wonderful presidents uh, that have joined you, you know, during your tenure. Um, you know, we've had a lot of them on the show as well. Uh, great, great people, good leaders. You know, one of the things I do know that you've advocated and I've seen it, and I think we're getting to the other side, a better side, is the professionalism of realtors. I think you have really been pushing for that. I, and, and talk to us about some of those things. So we have new legislation in the provinces called the Trust in Real Estate Services Act. And the good news is they took um, geez, pretty much all of our ideas and put them into legislation that will make that realtor at your side, the professional that you depend upon for the biggest investment and in, in, uh, product that you own in your entire life, to make sure that that advisor is a leader in North America when it comes to education and professionalism and a strong disciplinary system if they are not. There was... One of the things that really impressed me as I took on this job and talked to realtors and our leaders at the board from the get-go, Todd, was how angry they would get when there was a real estate agent who broke the rules, who took advantage of a buyer or seller, and their view was, you know, more slaps on the wrist we want than booted out of the profession. So this brings forward a number of changes, including tougher discipline to make sure you can have trust in that advisor when you're making that biggest purchase. Yeah, I think that's a huge thing, especially for the consumers out there, because again, a couple of bad apples really have affected, I think, the overall impre- impression of the industry itself. You know, I can tell you, you know, having been licensed for virtually 30 years, there is amazing realtors out there. But there's that odd one that you make, you know, you question yourself, why are they allowed in the industry? And it's nice to see that, you know, Aria is actually taking a stance on this because before... You know, obviously the Real Estate Council of Ontario was basically, you know, judge and jury for this, but it's better that, you know, the governing bodies and and the associations are now also throwing in their hat saying, hey, look at, you know, we understand that you're the one who can find or take somebody's license away, but us as an association, uh, you know, we have power also to be able to start looking at our members and saying, hey, if you want to be part of this, you've got to raise your game. You've got to realize who you represent. And I think I think a lot of the problem was is that the idea of who you represented got lost there for a few years. I, I, I think that people actually forgot, or some realtors, that their clients are the ones who you should be watching out for, not your commission. Yeah, absolutely. A client-first mentality, you see that reflected in our leadership and now in the legislation to make sure that is the case in every city, town, or village across the province. So that legislation too, I'm, I'm pleased to say when the government brought it in, the Ford government, a biggest support from all political parties, it actually passed unanimously. Wow. In, in, in the house. That's you rare. don't see that very often. <laughs> and for, you know, for realtors, it's brought in, you know, new tools that will help them reinvest in their business in terms of personal real estate corporations, a modernization of advertising laws so you can actually call them real estate agents and realtors, not salespeople, because this yeah. is a much more important function than simply sales. Sure. And uh, also a lot more consumer protections around uh, disclosures, 
a, a greater disciplinary system, making sure the relationship between a realtor and his or her client is crystal clear what those roles and responsibilities are and what they are not. So this was a major triumph for the real estate profession, and most importantly, for buyers and sellers. Yeah. And, and, and I will say congratulations to Aria because I know how hard you were advocating for this. You know, um, you definitely, you know, we, you, you see the notices, you see the push to the different levels of government. And I think that's really important that people understand that, you know, when you have an association that has the voice and the power of the voice that you have, I mean, when we think about it, how many members are now part of Aria? 96,000 is <laughs> counting. Yeah. There's a, uh, been a strong, uh, in, well, I mean, you've talked about this in your business, a number of investors that are, are now with you as well. There is a greater interest across the board in real estate. I think it may have passed hockey and probably approaching the weather as a top topic for, for Canadians uh, and for good reason. I mean, it is, it is a, a proven uh, long-term investment. It is life-changing. I know, Todd, when I bought my first home back in 2002, I changed as a man. I cared more about my neighbors, my, my property, got more involved in the community. You can put study after study that demonstrates that the kids of homeowners do better in school, the health outcomes, the kind of jobs they get, right? That's why it's such an important uh, aspect of our, our culture here in, uh, in Canada. So it's reflected, I think, in the number of investors you're seeing, the number of realtors. But we want to make sure that each of those 96,000 is best prepared to be there at your side when you're making the purchase of your, your first home, an investment home, or where you're retiring. Excellent. Well, listen, Tim, I'm going to uh, go to a quick break. I want you to stay put. Folks, I've got Tim Hudak here in the studio with me, and we'll have more when we return. And don't forget, if you're not following me on Instagram, the Simple Investor One, and you'll be able to catch some clips of Tim and I. So uh, make sure you tune in, and we'll be right back after this. And welcome back. If you're just tuning in, my guest this hour joining me here in studio is Tim Hudak. Yeah, you know that name sounds familiar. First and foremost, you've heard him here on the, st uh, the station for years and years and years. Uh, with the Tim Hudak Show, but as well, uh, Tim is currently the CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association, and he is the former leader of the Provincial Conservative Party. And Tim, just before the break, you know, um, we were talking about, uh, you know, what a a big difference we've seen over the last few years with you at the helm of Aria, that you're really doing a lot of great advocacy work, you know, pushing more, and, it, it, and it's amazing because it's not self-serving. You're not just pushing for realtors, you're actually pushing for the public. And that was one of the things, you know, you know, I've had some uh, conversations over the years, and, and and I remember you reaching out to me once, and you said, "Hey, Todd, you know, what can we do? What can we do for the, the realtors and the business?" And I, you know, one of my biggest things was, you know, we need to educate the public more too. It's not just it's not just educate realtors, but it's also educating the public. You know, what should they perceive realtors to be? What should they be looking from their, for the realtor? You know, because there some people have no idea what to expect. Yeah, absolutely, and. I, I'm pleased to say because of, of the work that we've done, the quality of realtors that are there to advise you and the importance of the purchase, it's also increasingly complex that the use of a realtor continues to increase. There were some that said, you know, well, it's AI is going to uh, intervene or you'll use a robot if you're a real estate agent, what have you. With the improvements of technology, there's no doubt that consumers are more advanced in their thinking about buying or selling a home, but they want that realtor, that real estate professional at their side in a negotiating approach and knowing what's happening in the neighborhood they want to go to. The bottom line has is actually that the number of, uh, the percentage of use of realtors continues to increase across North America. And that's a smart decision by consumers. Yeah, I think so. I think I think what uh, a lot of times the perception of what a realtor does, uh, you know, a professional realtor um, isn't just, uh, you know, the sales aspect of it. It's actually, you know, having the local knowledge, knowing what's going on in the neighborhood, what's the best schools, you know, being able to drill down on a property, you know, a lot, what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, not, and, and, and it's not to, to you know, discourage home inspections, but not all home inspection inspectors know exactly what's going on with that house. They don't know the history of the house necessarily. So there's so much more to a real estate transaction than how much money do you have? And, you know, I feel that during the COVID time and when we really started seeing that peak in 2021, I think people kind of forgot the necessity of a realtor where it was just like, you know, that, that feeding frenzy, you know, multiple offers, there was 80 offers on a property. It's like, well, what's your realtor doing for you right now? They should still be doing everything they were supposed to do. They're just trying to advise you what you should and shouldn't pay. But you know, that, that completely changed, I think, people's perception. Yeah. There's, there's no doubt there is, there is nobody better placed to be an advocate for, for homeowners 
and those who want to join their ranks than an Ontario realtor. Two reasons I say that. You mentioned earlier, Todd, they're not only experts in, in housing and the, and the transaction around purchasing a home or a property, they're experts in the neighborhood and, and, and the community and all the things that you're going to have to think about for your kids, your retirement, your entertainment, experts on what's happening. That's why it's cr- critically important to use a realtor when making that, that purchase. And number two, I, you know, I noticed this when I was leader of the Ontario PC party. I would talk to all kinds of groups and go to every you know, event under the sun. I was always impressed, Todd, by the grassroots roles of realtors across the province. So you know, really rolling up their sleeves, helping the community, whether it's a Rotary Club or the Lions, the Boys and Girls Club, the hockey, soccer, gymnastics, the school council. There's no better profession than giving back to the community at the grassroots level than Ontario realtors. And that reinforces their value as being champions of that neighborhood or that community. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the, one of the things, and this was a just kind of an off story, but there was, um, uh, I, I knew of a transaction that happened and this lady ended up buying a house and what she didn't know was it backed onto a cemetery and the realtor she used wasn't local and didn't know about the cemetery, bought the house firm and then all of a sudden moves in and realizes that part of the property backed onto the cemetery. And this is why, you know, I always, and, and, and you and I touch on this, the grassroots uh, realtor, the local realtor, I like people trading in their you know area of influence and understanding. I think that's really important, and I just think it makes everybody stronger, and the transaction uh, you know more valid. And 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 again, it gives everybody that informed consent of what they're transacting. Yeah, it's a that's a great anecdote to to share. There is a an old expression you've probably heard in the world of politics. Tip O'Neill, the former Speaker of the House in the states said all politics is local, basically wrote a book about it. Same thing in real estate, right? All real estate eventually gets down to local and local knowledge. Yeah, no, that's that's very important. Now, listen, one of the things, to, you know, when you talk about local knowledge, though, you're on the road a lot. You are all over the province talking to, you know, the different areas of the association. I know that, you know, I get a clip here and there that, you know, you, you, you're up in Sudbury or North Bay or, you know, you're all over the place. So what are you finding when you do that? I need to say, uh, I, I, I love that. I just get energy. I mean, that, as I mentioned earlier on, on the show here, love being here. Like the, the, what you've done here, they, it exudes, you know, energy and inspiration. It's got a very nice home look to it as well. Like I do not feel I'm in a corporate environment, for example. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Quite the opposite. It feels very relaxing at home. And it's just nice to hear how you, your staff, the team here are reacting to it. So when you go into a, a brokerage, um, you, you visit even a, a corporate headquarters of one of the real estate brands. You talk to audiences, you really can soak up that environment. And when people are at home, right, they're where they feel most comfortable, you're going to get the best kind of advice and feedback possible. We are a big province. We're a complex province. We're made up of many regions that also really can, you can seep in when you're actually there, see, feel, right? Then you can make the best decisions when you're acting with government or making direction to your staff or advice from the board of directors at area. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting because as as the years have gone on, you've also improved a lot of programs for uh, realtors themselves. So let's talk about that because you've got some new launches that you're doing. You know, you are working on more. I also want to call it healthcare for for realtors. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me do a couple of things first, and I'll come to our, our wellness program. So for for those realtors um, listening or fans of real estate, at our website aria.com, all the information on our research that we do that will help in the job or an investment decisions around real estate and consumer demand. There's the standard forum series that we also do. For any problem that a realtor will encounter in real estate, there's a standard form. That's the common language of realtors across the province, wherever you work. So I'd encourage members to watch our webinars, our updates through our standard forums. I mentioned our new legislation as well, the Trust and Real Estate Services Act. We actually have, including our, our past president, I know it's been on your show, Ray Ferris, a panel of experts will go into a brokerage or an office to talk about what the new legislation is going to mean to day to day. So there's some some new launches that we've done. I want to encourage folks to use when they're fans of real estate and work in the profession. We have we've done something very exciting with the Ontario Realtor Wellness Program, and Todd, I appreciate you asking this. When we survey our members, the biggest thing that comes out uh, is making sure they have access one point of access to all real estate data. Some progress being made in that direction. Hope folks continue. And number two is some kind of safety net. Because in many places, you work in a corporate environment, you work in government, your neighbors, your friends, a lot will have 
a benefits program as a result of that for, for the health and wellness. It doesn't exist for realtors, independent contractors. So they identified that some kind of safety net, if luck turns against them, would be a very valuable investment. So the good news is that we are, we've announced that we're going to deliver, uh, beginning in January, a realtor wellness program that will help cover medical bills, paramedical, like uh, chiropractic uh, care, massage, health benefits, and a solid insurance package to actually give that safety net for realtors and their families. Wow, that's huge because, you know, I, I can tell you, you know, living a life without that, um, you know, everybody's looking at <laughs> over, unless you have a spouse that actually has, you know, spousal coverage, you're, you know, a lot of realtors, they they have to fly by the seat of their pants. Exactly. And, and, um, and, and some do, and they have that coverage, and this will be an enhancement that they could use both, right, to top up and pay the rest of the bill. Um, but I'll tell you, the other day I was actually in in um, in Muskoka and I ran into a, a, a realtor, a single mom, and tell she has three kids and she's not been able to afford any kind of insurance. One of the kids has special needs, and she said, um, "Tim, please, please tell the board directors this is a life changer for me." She had tears in her eyes and got choked up. She said, "This has been my biggest desire. I lose sleep at night, and now there's going to be a package available to me and to my family." just to give us that sense of security and well-being. Yeah, no, that's huge. And I, I, I you know, I commend you and, and the rest of your staff there to, to push this forward. Because again, it's one of those things that kind of a, a missing link to the true profession that real estate is. Um, Tim, I'm going to ask you to hang on for a minute. We're going to come, come back, uh, you know, in a few minutes, folks. I've got Tim Hudak here in the studio with me and great to have him join me. It's been a long time since I've been able to have a face-to-face, you know, during COVID, we We had some Zoom meetings, but it's great having them here in studio. And when we come back, we'll have more. So stay with us. We'll be right back after this. And welcome back. If you're just tuning in, in the studio with me, I have Tim Hudak. And Tim is the former leader of the Ontario uh, Conservative Party as well. He's currently the CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association. Tim, so far, it's been great having you back. Awesome having you here in the studio. I need you to put your political hat back on, though, okay? <laughs> sure, yeah. You and, I, you and I talk real estate really well on and off air, um, but I got to tell you, um, there's some great things happening mm-hmm. in, in the political landscape and some stuff that I think everybody should start looking over their shoulder and do it quickly. And I know I don't want to put you on the spot, but let's let's talk about, you know, Certain things that are going on, you know, we just had the Toronto election, of course. We've got a, a new mayor there. Um, I'm going to, I, I, if people listened to my show last week, you know I wasn't happy about it. Um, I'm still not happy about it. I don't think I'm going to be happy for the next few years about it. I think that we have to be very mindful of some of the activities that could happen. The idea of increasing property taxes, the idea of doing certain things. I just, I, you know, I, we understand we have to, you know, increase property taxes. But it sounds like it's going to be a lot heftier bill than most people think. Yeah, um, we, we need governments to to focus when it comes to housing on just getting more homes built and more rentals that people can afford. They're just don't get distracted by shiny baubles. We're not going to tax our way to affordability. Focus on getting spades in the ground and homes built. And as we began 2023, if I had thought about the risks ahead, I didn't imagine this would happen. Um, but the notion of John Tory stepping down as mayor of Toronto puts a lot at risk. When you look at the spectrum of the different levels of politics, think of the Olympics. The gold medal is really the province. They have the greatest ability to get more affordability for, for folks across Canada. Province of Ontario has done a very good job. Then it comes to cities, there's silver medal. The federal government is really the bronze. It's not as much. They can do a few things, Todd, but their role is not as critical. And as mayor of Toronto, uh, John Tory is actually moving forward very aggressively on getting more homes built. And he had council support for that, doing a lot of things that we were encouraging and Treb was encouraging, the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board. And we stepped down that, put a lot at risk. And now we have Mayor Chow in office, duly elected. She ran a very strong campaign. I admire that as somebody who's been through a number (laughs) of campaigns myself. But I do worry. Uh, I think many of the policies that she put forward when it comes to housing are going to take us backwards. Yeah, and that's that's a real concern because you and I can you know we're we're we've been around long enough to watch you know other parties that have had a damaging impact to especially rental housing. You know, I'll I'll go back into the late '80s. Um, Bob Ray obviously had a very uh, you know when he put in rent control. We understand what rent control does, but the immediate impact was all builders decided not to build purpose-built rentals. 
And we had this huge gap that got created and only condos were being built at the time where we still needed to encourage builders. Even back then, like in the 80s and 90s, we still needed to encourage builders to build. And that's the private sector. It's the one thing that I think you and I both agree on that the private sector has to be a big driver here as well. So how do we do that? Is it by you know gifting land? Is it by giving them big tax incentives? Is it by cutting red tape? And unfortunately, what I'm seeing with, you know, let's say the newest, you know, uh, leader there in Toronto, I don't, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear any of that. I didn't hear that. Listen, I'm going to, I'm going to get the building done. Like you said, I didn't, I didn't see a shovel in that campaign. What I heard was there was a lot of stuff being shoveled, but you know, not, <laughs> not using the right shovel. <laughs> Yeah, I um, look, it feels like we're back in 1991. Now, 91 was a good year for me. I turned 24 that year. I was off at University of Washington. I was having a good time, good music. I was into the grunge scene at the time. Not so great for real estate policy. You mentioned under Bob Ray that brought in a very strict regime of rent controls that put put any kind of you know new purpose-built housing on hold for a very long time and a notion that government should build the housing. So I feel like we've gone back 22 years here with very outdated policies. It's going to be up to us to support Treb, work with the new mayor. But this notion that the solution is use government land to build government-owned housing as going to help on the affordability front, it, it well, those projects will take forever knowing how government operates. Yep. They'll be way more expensive. They won't be maintained. They won't give good choice. You've got to work with builders, use the government land, but work with builders to get more homes built quality, faster, more affordable. Yeah. And, you know, you, you touched on something perfectly right there. So if it's owned by the government, you know, the funny thing is they're, they're absentee landlords. They don't care. You know, it's like, yes, we built it. If somebody ran it down too bad, when you're an actual landlord, you actually care about your stuff. If you're the builder owner, you care about it. So you'll go and we'll, you'll, we'll repair it. But government housing has been a real struggle. Oh man. So I'm just picturing you again, you get a beautiful place. So you, you fill this up, you got 200 people here for a simple investor seminar. Have them raise their hand and say, how many of you want to live in government housing? <laughs> <laughs> like, like how many hands are, are going to go up? That That is not the solution. It it, it could well, force people into lower quality housing. And um, this is definitely a policy that should be left behind in the Bob Ray era. And there's other opportunities to follow what Mayor Tory had set out or even Premier Ford that would really help people in Toronto when, where Toronto leads I think other major municipalities will follow. And right now, they're pointing in the wrong direction. Okay. So because I, I I respect and appreciate your opinion so much, I'm going to put on a different hat right now, okay? And I'm going to ask you to tell me what we should do. So I'm going to pretend I'm Premier Ford. I uh, just had my French fries. <laughs> and now I need you to tell me, what do you think the province should do to help with this housing crisis? Okay. Now I'm craving French fries. I can't do it. <laughs> the salt and iron and the... Um, Number one is hold municipalities accountable. So picture it this way. that I mentioned earlier that the province has passed five pieces of legislation. That combination of new approaches is the most pro-home ownership and pro-rental that I've seen in my lifetime. It is the right path to get more homes built that people can afford, whether you're in a big city or a small town. I'm glad to go into more details momentarily. But picture that toolkit. But the municipalities now have to open that toolkit and they have to use the tools in that toolkit to get things done. The province has set a goal for the top, I think, 25 municipalities, Todd. Here is your share, right? Just as you're in business, if you don't actually set goals and measure, you're not going to make any progress. Good. Here is your share. Now use the tools. So my number one advice to the Premier would be make sure municipalities actually open that toolbox and use the tools. Tools should be a carrot and stick approach, quite frankly, with the province. Carrot, municipalities say we're here in Burlington. They hit their target. They get homes built. They say no to NIMBY forces. They do the right thing. Reward them. Next major transit project, their big arena, hospital, whatever, incent that. But in this it closes their doors. They cower before the NIMBYs. They say, we don't want newcomers. We don't want our kids to come in. Tied up in process. Well, their project goes to the bottom of the line. That kind of carrot and stick approach, my number one advice to the premier, and actually incent progress and success. Uh, I, I love it, actually. I haven't had anybody on the show say that to date. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. And, you know, a lot of people sit there and say, yeah, but you're bribing the government to go. No, no, we're getting results because the only way it can happen is you've got the end result having the new builds. Yeah. Well, here you got an employee that does a really good job. I, I imagine they're first in line to get a raise. Somebody doesn't do their job. They don't last very long. Right. So we need to do the same thing in that partnership between the province and municipality. Use the tools that you've been given, which means intensifying in 
you know, urban areas, along transit lines, above transit stations, fantastic. Look for areas to convert underutilized commercial properties into residential or mixed use properties. In areas that are outside of the urban centers for land that's not environmentally sensitive, allow municipalities to develop that and build more middle-class homes that people can afford. There's three examples right there of what the government tools will allow. We just need to make sure they do use them. Yeah. Well, here's hoping that they do. <laughs> um, Tim, maybe we need to get you to go back into politics and, and, and show people the light because, you know, you've been able to do so well with with uh, ARIA that you have a good understanding, I think. And and I think that's part of it. We need more government to have a better understanding about the real the real estate crisis. You know, I, I think a lot of people are buying votes right now with numbers by saying, oh, we're going to build this, we're going to build that. You know, we've seen it in the Toronto mayor. Uh, you know, election. We've seen it provincially. We've seen it federally, federally all the time. And yet we're still where we are. And the other important advice I'd give on number two is what I call the shiny bobble syndrome, right? They'll hear about some idea, then they'll, a politician will grab onto it. It may sound good in a headline, but it's actually damaging to real estate affordability. I'll, there's two examples. One maybe we can talk about later, and that's the proposed idea of a cooling off period on, on resales. My other one is an Olivia Child one where she says, well, she wants to increase the vacancy uh, tax. And, and look, the, the notion that you'd have to create a bureaucracy that would make sure how long people are living in their homes, check up on them to make sure they're not using too much hydro or how much you know water is coming in, like trying to monitor that, enforcement and appeals mechanism, all the resources that go into hiring the bureaucrats to do that. Imagine, Todd, if they were put forward and knocking down some outdated red tape and barriers to new housing, you'd actually make progress. There is an example of shiny bobble system. So I'm going to have you hold that thought. Yeah. Because we got to talk about that when we come back. I'm, I'm going to be right back with Tim Hudak. So stay with us. We'll be right back after this. And welcome back. It's amazing how fast an hour can go by. Um, I just, uh, I've got Tim Hudak here in the hot seat with me uh, at the studio. Great having him here. Tim, just before the break, um, you know, you, you got on a roll, which I thought was absolutely awesome about, you know, the shiny bobble um, syndrome that happens out there. And when you were talking about, you know, what, what the, the adverse effect is, what's your next line? In terms of the other shiny bobble? Yeah. Yeah. So another one that, that they're doing in British Columbia, and we've been talking to the province of Ontario about the damage caused, and the minister has resisted this, but it's a notion of a cooling off period on resale homes. Now at ARIA, we support a cooling off period when you're purchasing a new home from a builder, you haven't seen it yet, the contracts are complex. They've got an army of, of lawyers and marketing individuals. And you should work with your realtor and you should have a cooling off period. It exists for condos, for example. But if you put it in a resale home, the power imbalance shifts. And I'll, I'll explain that to you. So there's a cooling off period when you're purchasing from a developer because it's an unlevel playing field between your mom and pop purchaser and that large producer of homes. But if it's a resale, you know, say my mom is selling the family home, wants dignity in her retirement and you make a cooling off period, then the power of dynamic flips and you could have that speculator who's going to put offers on five, six different homes simultaneously, see what they snap up. And then during that cooling off period, basically put a gun to my mom's head and say, hey, if you don't drop the price, then I'm going to pay you a thousand dollars and walk away from the deal. And then she has to go through the whole relisting period, the risk of looking stale. That is a damaging policy that actually hurt home ownership, put fewer homes on the market and really hurt homeowners on their major investment in source of savings. Thankfully, Todd, so far the Ontario government has resisted that, but BC, they've run down that path with some very negative consequences. Yeah, and you know, that's concerning because I think sometimes, you know, monkey see, monkey do. And so if a couple provinces start grasping on this, uh, certain things here, um, you were talking about the idea of the vacancy taxes. And so, so there's a lot of people out there, and it's kind of funny, um, Vacancy, they're normally nailing it down a little bit more condos. They keep talking about foreign buyers. You and I know that the numbers weren't quite what everybody thought. You know, people thought 20, 30% of transactions were happening from foreign buyers. Well, not the case. We know what the numbers truly were. But here's my problem with so certain things. When you've got a condominium, okay, and there, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, there shouldn't be any vacant units in a condominium. Did you ask the next door neighbor of the condo who turns around and says, well, there's nobody living there, so you must like that because it's quiet. The other thing is it's also not taxing your actual maintenance fees because when the person next door is not living there, they're not using the water, they're not using the amenities. So it's kind of funny how there's kind of a, 
a catch-22. You know, you can sit there and say, well, let's fill every single one. Okay, I, I need condominium owners to be aware. Chances are your condominium fees are going to go up even more so. And this is one of those big complaints. So when we talk about the vacancy tax, the idea here, and, and you know, there's been uh, BC, I, I think you heard it in the news, they're considering looking at forcing uh, your second property. So if you own a cottage, if you don't occupy it six months of the year, you're going to be forced to turn around and rent it for six months of the year. And then if you want to go and use it yourself, you're going to have to pay the tenant to move out. That makes no sense to me. No. And, and that will, you know, limit the amount of investment that's taking place in having units available for people. And I, I, I spent 21 years in, in government and I wouldn't trade it for the world and took a lot of lessons away. What I learned is those 21 years fly by. There's only so much time in any given year that you can get things done. Just like running a business, there's only so many resources you have. And if you have people monitoring these programs, creating these programs, you know, it's, it's finding out if somebody's broken the rules and appeal, all of that stuff, that's a big investment of the resources available. And if you put that, here's an example, to get rid of some of the bad red tape or outdated laws, there's a project in, in Toronto we heard about on the Housing Affordability Task Force where because of a shadow that fell into a park and occupied less than 10% of a park on the summer solstice, I think it's a solstice, right? Is the equinox solstice? I've read the <laughs> summer solstice, I'll say. And that was the only time of year. And because of these outdated shadow rules, they actually had a knockdown. I think it was six stories, 30 units were, were lost, made them affordable because of this silly rule. Focus the dogs on going after those outdated rules that keep affordable homes off the market instead of creating some new reporting mechanism. Yeah. You know, you, it was interesting. You mentioned, you know, your, your career, 21 years. I mean, and, and you were one of the youngest people in the house at the time, were you not? Yeah, I, I like to say that while I was the second youngest, I was the most immature. So hopefully that, uh, that counts for something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely matured through your 21 years. But, you know, as, as you mentioned, well, taking a look at some government policies, and I guess this is where we need to drill it down, is that, you know, change doesn't happen overnight. We know that. Okay, we're not going to solve the housing problem overnight, but I think part of what has to happen is we've got to get the right advocates in the government to actually start doing the baby steps. And it seems like all they do is they keep, uh, you know, painting this huge picture, but forgetting that you got to get the paints in the brush. And yet they paint, they've already got the whole picture painted. It's like, we're going to solve the problem. We're going to build 1.5 million homes. How about you build five, 10? How about we go to, you know, 10,000, 20,000? Yep. How about we get it? So how about you, you reach out to us six months from now and say, we're on our way. We've just completed 10,000 homes. That's the government I want in place. Yeah, it's a great example, right? To show the progress on, on getting towards that 1.5 million. And, and that's what was, that's actually needed. It wasn't pulled out of the air. That came from our task force, not only to build homes for millennials, you know, new Canadians, but catch up for those that didn't get homes over 20 years. But I like that idea of showing steps along the way, all part of that measurement. Just to go back for a second and mention the sort of the Olympic stand and the province is most important. I will commend them. Um, we did hit the largest number of homes for two years in a row now and 23, I think will be a good one. And you've been part of that with your investors as well. And when it yep. comes to the rental side, thank you for doing that. Silver is the, is the municipality. The bronze is the federal government. Here's how the federal government could help though. They can impact, and that's the immigration system. You and I talked about this uh, off air. And, you know, if you tweak the immigration system, which really rewards university degrees, my background, I get it. It's not easy to come into Canada or investors. But how about this? Add on more points for the skilled trades. Yep. Reward new Canadians who can actually build the homes, the roads, the hospitals, the subways we need. That would be a major positive change the federal government can make. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that that actually should be the way that we start looking at immigration is that, you know, like you said, university, doctors, you know, look, we, we need, we need a gamut. But the problem is, is the one thing that, you know, people are afraid to talk about is the number of trades people that are going to be retiring over the next 10 years. We've got a, you know, we've got an aging demographic of trades people and there are people hanging on just because there's nobody to replace them. You know, the, the, the next gen doesn't want to get their hands dirty and, you know, I've got, I've got people working, you know, uh, behind the scenes with us and, you know, they're in their seventies and you just can't find, you know, a decent electrician. So you're working with somebody that's in their seventies and they're saying, well, why don't you retire? Well, because I'm needed, you know, it, it's amazing what we, the predicament we have ourselves in because, you know, the trades got shunned and yet 
for us to get out of the problem that we have, which is more housing, we need more trade. That's the only way. Like everybody can sit there and say, well, the government's going to give us money. We're going to get this. We're going to get that. Yeah, but you need the people to build it. And if you don't have the people to build it, folks, you're going to have even a worse problem. Yeah, you, you nailed it in very passionately. So, uh, Todd, um, Marty McNaught, the Labor Minister, I think is making some very important progress in getting more people to trades who are here in Canada already, targeting through the high schools, new programs, knock down some of the you know, outdated rules that restricted people to getting in the trade that made it tougher. Good. But we are going to need more people. And the point I want to reinforce here too is this is part of our history in Canada. I mean, coming from the Niagara area, the, the Welland Canal, the Beck Hydroelectric Project, the QEW that it took to get here today, all built, right, by new Canadians coming to our country that had those skills to build. It's time to build again. So let's change our immigration system to recognize that. Yeah. Well, Tim, I got to tell you, it's amazing how fast an hour goes by. You and I could easily do, you know, two, three. What we need to do is, you know, simply real estate, Tim Hudak show, you know, two, three hours. We'd have a great time, but love having you back in the studio. Great to see you. Thank you for coming in today. Yeah, my, my, my pleasure. And again, congratulations on what you've built here. It's, it's a joy to see you face to face, but man, this is an impressive uh, new HQ. So congratulations. Thanks so much. Folks, uh, Tim Hudak, he is the CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association, and he used to be the former leader of the Provincial Conservatives. But hey, listen, you know what? Awesome to have him in studio. I do want to thank my producers in-house here, Aiden and Omar. They keep it simple for me every single week. I want to thank Ian Grant at head office. Yeah, he's just going to make sure that we did everything right. And more importantly, I want to thank you for tuning in and making us the number one real estate talk show And of course, I'll be back next Sunday. As usual, I'm your host, Todd C. Slater. You've been listening to Simply Real Estate right here on News Talk 1010.